Thank you. <laughs> Need some coffee. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. My name is Steve McMenamin, and um, I'm your host for today's event, which is part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Uh, our underwriter this morning is Putnam Lavelle, NBF, and our topic is the outlook on currency and foreign exchange strategies. Uh, this is our first examination of an asset class whose influence on the investment markets is rising quickly. Uh, our speakers today are world-class athletes in their respective fields. I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, Robert Mundell is professor of economics at Columbia University for over 30 years. Uh, before Columbia, he was on the staff of the IMF, a professor at Chicago, and editor of the Journal of Political Economy. Uh, he's, he's been um, advisor to several international agencies such as the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, and several governments in Latin America, Canada, uh, Europe, the Federal Reserve Board, and the U.S. Treasury. Uh, among his med many original breakthroughs, he is known as the father of the theory of optimum currency areas, uh, and he was an originator of supply-side economics. Uh, he's written extensively on the history of international monetary system and played a significant role in the founding of the euro. In 1998, uh, he was made Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 1999, he received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science. Sitting next to Bob, to his left, Arun Motiani is the Director of Research at the Citigroup Private Bank. Uh, there, the research team is part of the Global Investment Group of the Private Bank, which forms the House View uh, for the Asset Management and Private Banking Divisions. Uh, he is also a member of the Asset Management Committee in that bank. Uh, Citigroup is the world's largest trader of international currencies. Uh, Arun joined Citicorp, or Citigroup, I should say, in September 1998 as an economist in the Chairman's Office and has a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge. Uh, sitting to Arun's left, Sandy Grossman is the founder of Quantitative Financial Strategies, one of the leading currency and global macro hedge funds. QFS, with almost $5 billion under management, was started in 1988. Uh, since 1993, its currency strategy has compounded at over 14%. Before founding QFS, Dr. Grossman held several important academic appointments at Stanford, Chicago, Princeton, and Penn's Wharton School. Before that, he was an economist for the, uh, for the governors of the Federal Reserve System, Sandy's original research and insights are widely published in leading economic and business journals. In 1987, he was awarded the prestigious Clark Medal. Sitting to my left, Hunt Taylor is the moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable today. He manages the investment portfolio for the Stern family and continues to be one of our most creative contributors to the, our board and our programming committee. Please welcome Hunt as he sets the stage for today's discussion. Hunt? Good morning. I was told a story recently um, in which George Bush, while riding his bicycle, um, uh, has an unfortunate accident with uh, one of his support vehicles and uh, lapses into a coma, where he remains uh, uh, until almost the end of his term. And um, through the miracle of modern science, um, he wakes, and after being reunited with his family, um, he has his first meeting with Dick Cheney. And uh, after catching up on the politics, he began discussing the economy. He asked Dick, uh, so Dick, how's the federal budget deficit doing? And Dick says, well, it's all gone. There is no deficit. So he says, well, it's, it's great. Um, how about the current account balances? He says, well, it's, uh, it's all squared. There's no, it's all even. He says, you're kidding. Well, how about inflation? He says, there is no inflation. Really? Yes. Unemployment? He says, there is none. He goes, well, Dick, that's a lot to absorb, and I, I'm getting a little tired. Would you mind going down and grabbing me a Washington Post? Uh, let me just kind of catch up slowly, and we'll meet again tomorrow. And he goes, sure. And as he's leaving, he says, by the way, how much is the Washington Post these days? And he says, two euros. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I have a long and checkered history with currencies, 
I was first exposed to currencies in 1984 when I was a genuinely ignorant floor broker on the cotton exchange. Uh, and I was approached by someone who was anything but a, an ignorant floor broker named Paul Jones, who had an idea for a new product uh, that was would be an index of currencies. Um, and he wanted me to help him get it up and get it running. Uh, and that was to become the U.S. dollar index, which is... Um, today pretty widely quoted as a benchmark of, of currencies and a, they kind of dubbed me to help them get that all started and that started my long odyssey uh, off the floor uh, which somehow wound me up sitting in this room God knows how but um, uh, and in that time um, I've come to learn that currencies are um, <sighs> a fact of economic life that can't be ignored or are ignored at an investor's peril. And I approach them um, with two points of view, uh, one I will describe as defensive and one I will describe as offensive. From a defensive point of view is what I've learned is that uh, currencies um, can move to valuations that go much further <coughs> than anyone can um, possibly imagine. Um, dollar index, which recently has swung between 80 and 84, uh, that summer in 85 was as high as 160. Um, they destabilize governments. Um, they destroy um, the balance sheets of corporations. They can ruin the economic prospects for entire sectors of economies um, and force intelligent investors to decide whether or not they need to adopt defensive strategies in protecting their portfolios broadly or whether to um, adopt uh, hedging or protective strategies on specific securities. Um, then there is the offensive mindset, which is periodically they represent superlative opportunities to capture excess return. Uh, and these uh, opportunities um, can and do deserve um, a place in a well-diversified portfolio. So the challenge uh, that I put to the panel today, uh, as always, this room represents uh, the completely diversified perspectives of the investment universe. And what we need to learn is um, we need this panel to illuminate the terrain for us as far as where are we um, in the world of currencies today. Do we need to take defensive action? Um, is it in our interest to consider offensive strategies? If so, how do we do it and how do we execute it? So um, with that mandate, um, I'll ask uh, the panel to kick off with Bob Mundell. Bob. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, to exchange views on this uh, subject. Um, the uh, question of what should uh, uh, of currencies as an investment class, um, uh, to me, uh, if we ask the question, should this be uh, part of a portfolio, in a way, this is a no-brainer because uh, every investment portfolio has some elements of speculation with respect to currencies. If you have a bond portfolio and it's in dollars, you'll have a very different result than if you have a bond portfolio and it's in euros or yen or some other currency or Canadian dollars or Australian dollars. So there's no real way of avoiding uh, positions on currencies in any portfolio. Uh, when uh, you think of... Uh, uh, the dollar and uh, the other main currencies, uh, you first have to look, of course, at the um, landscape, the currency landscape of the world. Uh, if you could imagine a, 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 a slide or something up here uh, with, filled with circles, each circle would, uh, could reflect the monetary power of a country, uh, more or less proportioned to GDP. So in the world, the biggest circle would be the dollar circle, 
with a GDP of close to $12 trillion. The second would be the uh, Euro circle with nine, $9 trillion, close to $9 trillion at current um, at the current exchange rate, and uh, $5 trillion in the, the yen circle. And then the fourth highest would be the, the uh, pound, the sterling circle, which is $2 trillion. The area is two trillion, and then the fifth would be the RMB, which is one and a half trillion. Uh, of course, the RMB is fixed to the dollar, so you could combine those two together, along with Hong Kong and the other countries in the dollar area, make that. But that's the important thing. These are the areas uh, that these four, three, or five currencies are the currencies that have global significance. I don't count in it the Canadian dollar or uh, the Australian. Uh, because uh, these currencies have great significance and they may be good inv as an investment class, uh, but they don't have uh, significance with respect to the whole system. What you can see over the past 30 years since uh, flexible exchange rates began in the 1970s uh, is a very pronounced dollar cycle. And that cycle uh, has been... Uh, uh, very systematic and in a way almost predictable, uh, certainly exposed. Uh, but uh, in, in the, if you look at this just in terms of one currency, you know, we can't use the euro back, uh, back then, but we can use the Deutschmark, let's say, which is symbolic of the euro. Uh, in 1975, uh, the dollar was 3.5 Deutschmarks. Five years later, it was half that. 1.7 Deutschmarks in 1980. And then five years later, in 1985, it was double that, 3.4 Deutschmarks. And then seven years later, in 1992, the dollar hit an all-time low of 1.34 Deutschmarks. It was in the ERM crisis. And then the dollar surged after that, and especially in the late 90s, uh, to... 2.3 Deutschmarks, uh, and then the dollar began its fall now today uh, to uh, 1.5 Deutschmarks, more or less something like that. Now, the dollar today then, by that standard, uh, is um, lower than it was in the uh, uh, late, uh, in 1980, but it's not as low as it was in 1992. Uh, of course, if you look at that in terms of the recent thing in terms of the euro, the euro started in at a dollar eighteen, and then went down to a low point of eighty-two cents, and then it's now went, it went up to a um, dollar thirty-five, and now it's at a dollar thirty today. But these are very, very strong movements. They represent sea changes in shifts of demand and supply, and you have to really try to puzzle out and, and find a reason why they why they occurred. In the late uh, 1970s, there was, uh, the, the U.S. had a very inflationary policy in the last part of the 1970s. The U.S. inflation rate in, for three years, peacetime inflation rate, 1979 to 81, 1979, 11 percent, 1980, 13 percent, 1981, 11 percent. Three years of back-to-back -back two digit inflation. And over this period, the dollar fell in half against the Deutschmark and most uh, other currencies, although not necessarily the yen. And then you got uh, the, uh, another big turnaround, a big shift, a complete change in the policy mix under uh, the Reaganomics. Supply side tax cuts, big increase in, in, in uh, defense spending to win the Cold War, and tight money on the part of Paul Volcker. Uh, after an initial two easy money period uh, to stop the inflation. And that shift in the policy made the dollar soar. And then the, after, after this, after 1985, the growth boom end, was ending, looked to be ending, and the U.S. wanted to get the dollar down. They organized the Plaza Accord in September 1985, and the dollar then started to go way down. That's what was the period that was really not getting the dollar down, that was getting the yen up. And the yen tripled in value from the time of the Plaza Accord in, uh, in uh, September 1985 to April 1995, 
when the dollar hit an all-time low against the yen of 78 yen. So the yen tripled in value against the dollar. And that, uh, of course, that ruined the Japanese banking system, created all the non-performing loans and all the problems of stagnation that the Japanese economy got into. But the, in, in terms of the story, then, going on with the story uh, of the strong uh, Euro or, or Deutsche Mark, this was German unification and a big increase in fiscal policy of $120 billion a year for 10 years to, re to develop uh, Eastern Germany. That shift was what made the Deutsche Mark uh, surge up and created the crisis in the ERM. And then uh, after that, the dollar came through, building on the supply-side tax cuts of the 1980s and the IT revolution, this very exceptional boom of the 1990s and the doubling of the U.S. growth rate that put the uh, dollar uh, very, very strong. And then the turnaround came with the dollar cycle with the weak dollar and the easy money in the part of the United States and the uh, current state that we're in now. Now, so this dollar, year, dollar cycle has been a cycle that uh, the U.S. has been able to manage and use and exploit for its own macroeconomic purposes. It hasn't been a big benefit help to Europe. It, uh, the euro goes up when it would be better for the euro to go down from the standpoint of European uh, business cycle. But it's helped the United States, and this has been something that's a problem for Europe. It's a, but now it's a problem also for the United States because uh, the low dollar now um, for the first time because the U.S. neglects the exchange rate. It doesn't really pay much attention to it. They neglect the inflationary effects of the low dollar just as they neglected the inflationary effects of the low dollar in the 1970s. It looks like there's a bit of a period, it looks to some extent as if now it's a period a little bit like the malaise of the late 19, 1970s, what uh, Carter called the, uh, Car called the uh, malaise. In that. But the problem is that um, the United States now uh, is, gets into that dilemma of policy where they, uh, um, because the inflation rate surges, Yesterday, the inflation rate was, came way up, and um, uh, it looks uh, double forecasts, panic in a way. And the Fed, with their lexicographic approach to monetary policy, will probably have to raise interest rates at a time when it looks as if the economy is weakening. And it's a very long-term time to maintain the interest rate. What they need to do is they need an extra policy instrument for this. And uh, this instrument should be the uh, dollar. The dollar uh, way to uh, stop the inflation is to pay more attention to the dollar and intervene on the, uh, on the dollar euro rate. It would be a good idea for Europe and a good idea for the United States. Uh, uh, I uh, had um, uh, last... Uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Europe, and I had an interview with Il Sole, an Italian newspaper. And uh, in that, I said, he was asking me what, I, what he thought Europe should do. And I thought about the exchange rates, and I said that I think that uh, Europe has a problem now of deindustrialization, certainly in the peripheral countries. Not Germany, but in, uh, in Germany it will come later. But uh, of deindustrialization, and that they're really damaging for Europe to have this high euro, and that he should put at the beginning absolutely a ceiling on the euro at $1.30 be very easy to put that ceiling on. They should cooperate with the Fed to do that. And now that helped, That would help Europe and it would help the United States in their macroeconomic policies. And that's, anyway, that's a, a thing that could be, could be uh, talked about. I talked about this uh, with uh, George Soros the other day and uh, he was saying, oh, but if you did that, maybe all the Asian central banks that hold all these euros, will, uh, all these dollars will want to convert into euros. Um, uh, at that rate, I don't think that I don't think so. I don't think they, that would be the case. But of course, uh, of course, he's, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, put my weight against his his, his skill in forecasting uh, exchange rates. But <clears throat> um, the uh, it, by, by the way, a big shift in the dollar in the big now the four four trillion dollars of foreign exchange holdings out there, and uh, three quarters of them are in dollars. And uh, all those countries that hold, more than half of them by far are held by the Asian central banks, four or five Asian central banks hold of $2 trillion worth. They would all love to have not 80% of their portfolio in dollars. They'd like to have 
60 percent in dollars and the rest in euros or, or, or some other other currencies. But they can't do that because such a, a tremendous shift if they started to do this. This is a, a global problem that, uh, to manage the, the part of the uh, inevitable consequence of the creation of the euro, which is a major, major change in the in the history of the international market. Well, I look upon the, the, the two the two most important uh, events, monetary events of the 20th century uh, is the number one was the uh, creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. And the second was the creation of the euro in 1999 at both ends of the century. These are what have dominated the, the, um, the uh, and are going to play a big role in the, in the future of, of this now. Um, well, I, here, um, I, I, I maybe spent too long on saying that. Uh, just a couple of things to touch on. The yen thing. The yen uh, has, uh, uh, people sometimes say that, oh, Japan has a very easy monetary policy. And they use two ways to show that it's got an easy monetary policy. First is that interest rates are very low in Japan, maybe close to zero in the short term rent, and long term rates are 2% or so. Uh, and, the, um, uh, and the second is that the rate of monetary expansion in Japan has been quite rapid. Well, neither of those proves an expansionary monetary policy, an easy monetary policy. An easy monetary policy has to create uh, an excess supply of yen. And a tight monetary policy would increase the excess demand for yen. So why that happens, why is there that excess, why is it that Japan keeps expanding the money supply, but demand is always absorbing it without any, uh, without spending it it's because uh, of the long expectation that the yen is going to appreciate. The same reason that you can have one or two percent interest rates in Japan and four or five percent interest rates in the United States because of the Japanese public expects the yen to appreciate against the dollar uh, as it has over the past uh, 30 years. The uh, yen has uh, tripled in value against the dollar. And if you do this again over the next 30 years, you get a rate of return on the dollar that is uh, un un holding yen that makes up for the very low interest rates. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing right now about um, the current account deficit. The current account deficit is a very important uh, issue for the United States. Uh, it's, but the deficit isn't new. The U.S. has had current account deficits uh, from uh, 1975. And uh, actually, over the long run, the U.S. had deficits up to 1915. Then from 1915 to 1970, the United States had, had balance of payment surpluses, has surpluses on current account, export, trade surpluses. And then since then, 75, they've had deficits, big deficits since 1982. And, uh, th and those deficits have been uh, have been continuing. So over the with the U.S. built up a big creditor position uh, that reached uh, a point uh, of, of a maximum around uh, 1975, and then the creditor position started to dwindle during the Reagan deficits period up to 1989, 1990, when the deficit, when the net creditor position of the United States disappeared. Since 1990, those deficits have been increasing at the rate of 2, 3, 4, 5 percent, so 6 percent of GDP. So the total indebtedness of the United States is now about something over $3.5 trillion. Now, the, the official figures would say something like $3.2 3 trillion. $3 trillion. The U.S. Has, has gross assets of is like uh, something like $11.5 trillion and uh, uh, no, eight and a half trillion, and liabilities of 12 uh, trillion, something like that. So that's the, the but these figures, of course, aren't, aren't reliable. There have been some people, some serious study that have redone the figures, and they they've made got some different um, different results on it. But so you can't put too much faith in it. But the the future is that with uh, something like 30 percent uh, debt, the net debtor position of the United States now at about. Uh, 30% of GDP. And next year, 
35 to 36 percent, and then 40 percent, and 45, and then 50, 50, etc. That starts to look like a problem in the long run. But it's not a panic problem by any means. It's, it's, even a 6 percent deficit could be sustained. I was at a conference recently uh, in Bologna, I said that again uh, in Bologna. Dick Cooper presented an argument, a solid argument that that uh, a, a six percent deficit is sustainable for the United States. It's an issue of what proportion of the capital stock it's going to be. If you do the numbers on it, it's not it's not a panic thing. However, we would all agree it's risky. So it is a it is something to worry about. But uh, this is uh, is not something that is going to be corrected by a big change in the dollar. When those when the U.S. tried to get the dollar down um, in the 1985, it didn't solve the problem of the deficits. The dollar in the w w very weak period of the dollar it hasn't didn't correct the uh, U.S. current account. The exchange rate issue is not what drives the deficit. What drives the deficit, a current account deficit of a country uh, has, uh, well, back the academics back in the 1960s, including myself, talked about three approaches to the balance of payments. And I was sort of associated with the monetary approach to it. But actually, there are 16 equivalences of the balance of payments. When you take into account the fact that it's the trade balance, and then it's the excess of uh, of uh, production over expenditure over total spending or absorption and then it has the counterpart in the way it's financed through the capital imports and foreign exchange accumulations and then every uh, every trade surplus every current account surplus is equal to the sum of the excess demands of uh, for securities and money in the country Japan has an export surplus and has had for 20 years because they have an excess demand for securities and money, and that's showed up. And then you have, that's four approaches. And you get eight approaches because every approach here, for, for looking at these, uh, the United States has its counterpart, its mirror image in the rest of the world. And that gives you eight, eight approaches. And then that's not enough because you've got, um, this is the static looking at today, but you have to look at the integration of stocks and flows and every Every uh, situation today has its counterpart in the uh, in the future. So to every, debts, uh, every debts today have to be repaid in the future, at least theoretically. So you get that. So that's where you get the issue of sustainability. Now, so I, what I'm saying is basically that when you look at all these things, it's not a big thing of panic. And the U.S. had a deficit uh, in when it had both a budget surplus um, and it had uh, back in the 19. Uh, late 90s and had a very strong dollar over that period. Now it's got a weak dollar. The trade deficit is not the, the main thing uh, driving, driving that thing. Now, when we come to uh, the, uh, I'll just uh, tidy up here, this, uh, the uh, end result here, um, what are the threats to uh, prosperity? I think the threats to prosperity are these huge swings in exchange rates that make for big swings in uh, financial markets and uh, uh, and and are is a threat to the uh, the so uh, to the world prosperity. So uh, I just say that um, uh, this is, isn't going to make people who are investing in in hedge funds very happy. Uh, but uh, I've uh, just written a paper uh, arguing that. That the best that the world needs a global currency, and uh, and that we, these exchange rate changes are not productive. You need something like a euro for the world economy, and that would internalize these exchange rate movements. And it would, of course, it would eliminate volatility and a lot of all the opportunities for profits in banks. But it would be a very useful, uh, very useful thing for the world economy. And this uh, uh, kind of idea has support from all, all kinds of, not just ac some academics, but also from uh, people like Paul Volcker, who's argued that a global economy needs a global currency. And he comes over every year to my meetings uh, in Siena that talks about this and makes uh, different plans for it. And I think the way in which that you can actually do this is to starting with two or three of the major exchange rates that the dollar, euro, yen exchange rates a day and make a basket of those and try to reduce the fluctuations in those rates and use that day, D-E-Y, uh, as a platform for creating uh, a global currency. Bob, if I may.
Um, let me ask you about this global currency concept and take you back to your role in creating the euro. Now, um, let's look at Europe today, if we may, for a second. There are those that would argue that the after effect of the euro is um, that we have um, Germany, which is mired in economic stagnation, and countries like Ireland, which is saddled with um, persistent inflation. And people will tell you that this is a result of the fact that at the time of the euro, Ireland came in at what is in retrospect too low an exchange rate. Germany came in, in at what is in retrospect too high an exchange rate. We have global trade, but that's comprised of regional economies and those economies change over time, if you eliminate currencies, which are a mechanism for adjusting those regional economies, how do they adjust? And will the euro, how will the euro compensate for the shifting fortunes of those regional mm -hmm. economies? Yeah. Well, the question is, uh, how useful is it to have an exchange rate or have a separate currency so you can devalue it or manipulate it? It's a little bit like the question, when uh, the um, um, oil prices quadrupled in the 1970s, uh, New England was a basket case. And a lot of Harvard professors were saying, it's too bad we didn't have a separate currency in New England so we could devalue it. Of course, the answer was, if the oil prices increase, devaluation wouldn't help. Devaluation would only make oil prices go up more in terms of the local currency. Or when, uh, when the uh, uh, oil prices collapsed, fell to $10 in, uh, in, in 1985, 86, the winter of this. Texas was a basket case, huge real estate boom. It was terrible. And, and, and Texas would have loved to have had a separate currency so they could devalue it. And maybe that would have been a short-run mechanism that would have spread around the misery a bit. But there would be no new resources come from, uh, from exchange rate changes. Exchange rate changes don't do anything. In the case of Ireland, people used to say, when I went over to uh, just after the euro was created, how can we have uh, 11 governments, this is before Greece came in, how can we have 11 governments um, and one currency? And then they act, how can you have the same monetary policy for Germany as you have for, uh, for Ireland? Ireland's growing at 10%. Germany going, was growing then at 2%. How can, you have the same, how can you have the same interest rate for both? Well, it's not an interest rate phenomenon. It's the same as if, if California grows at 10% and New York grows at 2%. It just means that more money will go to California. The money goes for the action is. And this is, is what the money gets through. Ireland's getting all the money it wants. And this has worked out well. And the price level in Ireland, because of differences in the indexes, will be a little higher than it is somewhere, but not very much higher. They're within a ballpark. There's just a very little difference between the uh, price levels. And in terms of at the present time, uh, Germany seems to be in bad shape. Uh, the Eurozone is not growing much this year, but Germany is in one of the big export booms of its tremendous surges in productivity, something like uh, uh, eight or nine percent, and their exports are just soaring. It's like it's a machine tools industry. It's really it's driving the uh, Euro, uh, the European economy, and it's ap it's been the main cause of the appreciation of the euro. And so while we can commiserate with the Germans in terms of GDP dollars of German GDP, it's 30 percent higher than it was uh, five, three years ago. So it's, uh, there's a lot going on there. I, I think every, every person in Europe now with the euro has a world class currency instead of a couple of junk currencies like the Portuguese and the drachma, Greek drachma and so on. Every, and every firm in Europe has a global capital market. And every country has a better policy mix than they had before. Even Germany. 
Germany's got, if Germany had been isolated and has had this same boom now, the Deutsche Mark would have soared uh, out, out, uh, way beyond what would have been sustainable. So this is, every country in Europe has a better monetary policy than they had before. There's a big problem with the, their fiscal discipline. There's no doubt about that, but, uh, but they, every country has that problem when during a, during a slowdown and during a kind of recession. Okay, Bob, thank you. Arun, what are your comments? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, <clears throat> unlike uh, my neighbor to the right, uh, who's um, an academic luminary, and I suppose one would be entitled to ask him, as, as I'm sure academics always ask, you know, will you put your money where your mouth is? Uh, for those of us who've never been academics, it's much easier. At an occasion like this, I simply have to put my mouth where my money is. Uh, well, in this case, I mean, it's not even my money, so it's, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but I do, I do, I do represent uh, a very large financial institution and uh, one of the larger sort of asset and wealth management firms. So, uh, so let me give you what I think. I mean, your questions, Hunt, were, uh, you know, where is the world of currencies going? Um, and, uh, you know, should, where can we take defensive action? Where should we have offensive strategies? Uh, also, in Steve's uh, initial circular to us, saying that he's trying to uh, sort of revive the art of storytelling, uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm the consummate storyteller here, but uh, at least I, I've come with a story. And so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be sort of, if I can mix my metaphors, I'm going to be painting in sort of some broad brushstrokes here. Uh, I think what's happening is that... Uh, and really to get to the, uh, to the heart of the matter, I think the, the euro-dollar rate is going to be extremely volatile over the next many years. It is, in fact, the key, the absolutely critical exchange rate in the world of currencies. Everything else is a variation on a theme. It's, uh, it's sort of a curlicue on the edifice. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we really have what appears to be two currency blocks developing we have the euro block, and we have a euro block which includes all the OPEC producers in a sense, even though many of them have linked to the US dollar, but they use their major export, which is oil prices, in a way which is loosely correlated to the, uh, the euro dollar rate, and that's because of certain structural features that oil producers have, which is that uh, they have... Uh, they trade equally with the euro area and the U.S., but they have much larger imports uh, from the euro area. So if, as the euro dollar rate depreciates uh, they, and oil prices do not change, they would actually have a severe deterioration in their terms of trade. Therefore, it is rational for them, which they're able to do given the cartelized structure of their market, they're able to push uh, the, uh, 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 the oil price up. Now, because of this, because the OPEC nations are swing producers and because they have this peculiar feature, therefore, as oil prices rise, it tends to pull in a whole lot of other countries as well. Almost all the commodity currencies, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, have now come in, have been pulled into the orbit of the euro, which is why you're beginning to, you have noticed for a while now of the kind of correlations that we see between the commodity currencies Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, uh, uh, South African rand, uh, Chilean peso, and uh, the, the Peruvian sol, and even even Canada, even the Canadian dollar, to some extent, has sort of you know it it, it is correlated with, with has a higher correlation with the euro than with the U.S. dollar, despite the strong trade links with uh, with the U.S. So, really, what we have is a currency, the euro. Uh, of a zone which is not exactly the most vibrant, the most dynamic. It is the second largest economic area in the world. Uh, but it has for reasons, because of the nature of trade and the nature of some sort of peculiar features of the structure of the world economy, it actually has a kind of centripetal tendency. It is pulling a whole lot of other currencies into its orbit. Uh, the U.S. dollar block is largely therefore linked to, given again, as Professor Mandel explained, the, the whole sort of, you know, the current, the current account deficit and the excess of expenditure over, over income, or put it differently, the very low savings here in the U.S. 
that has resulted in a kind of constellation of key manufacturing countries, Mexico and the emerging Asian economies in its bloc. And the structure for that reason is reasonably stable. So you have the commodity currencies, including the oil producers, around the euro, and you have the major manufacturing emerging markets in the U.S. dollar. There are certain migrations that are happening, and we've already witnessed them over the last six months. We are seeing large emerging economies with very large domestic markets, which have tended to be closer, have tended to move closer with the U.S. dollar that have now started to migrate into the euro bloc, the Indian rupee and the Brazilian real, for instance. And that is because as they stayed close to the dollar, as high commodity prices and high oil prices started to import inflation in, they, unlike the major manufacturing economies of the world like, uh, like uh, South Korea or, 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 or Taiwan or Thailand or whatever, they have not been able to use the margins to act as a sort of shock absorber. So they have allowed inflation to come into the system and that is not acceptable for domestic reasons. Uh, they have their large domestic markets and so they have had to tighten policy monetary policy, and that has resulted in the rupee and the real uh, beginning to strengthen. And we will see that happen. So one of the things that you're going to see is this migration of some of the key emerging markets out of a kind of de facto dollar block into a kind of somewhere in the orbit of, of the euro. And those, I think, are certainly where we can have some offensive strategies. Those are the ones where over the next 12 to 24 months you're going to see subject, of course, to the euro-dollar rate, you're going to see significant appreciation uh, against, uh, against, the, uh, uh, against the dollar. And, uh, and so that, that sort of jump from one orbit to the next, I think, is, is one way to, uh, to, to have an offensive strategy. Uh, China is very much a question mark. It lies in the dollar block, but a combination of possibly protectionist pressures. They've certainly been able to take care of the sort of the problem that India and Brazil have, which is that they did have an overheating of their economy. They did have uh, 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 their inflation pick up. They've been able to use administrative measures and a very gentle tap on the monetary policy breaks, and it looks as if they've been able to, to control matters. But protectionism is, is a problem where China's concerned more for symbolic reasons, but nevertheless, they are, they are sort of something that, you know, we, we, ha we have to look at. And more recently, perhaps even geopolitical reasons, which takes us into an area which is sort of very complicated, and, uh, and I don't want to go into that uh, uh, too much here. But I think their decision to stay in the dollar block or to move out of the dollar block and essentially go into the euro block, if, if that's an acceptable way to put it. I don't think the Chinese would ever think that they belong to any block but their own. But I think that move is going to be quite critical. But if, even if that had to happen, I don't think the rest of emerging Asia would follow China necessarily into that block. I think the, the U.S. dollar block can be fairly self-contained and fairly stable. The large current account deficits and especially if you include Japan in there. Now, Japan is a major oil importer, major commodity importer, but it has, it's been blessed, if I may say so, with deflation. So if that is the case, then they don't really need to worry about the kind of inflation surging in from high commodity, high input prices. So Japan is likely to stay in the dollar block, and clearly it hasn't. It has moved with the euro, and so we expect it to move back up again. So whether we use Professor Mandel's monetary approach to the balance of payments, where you look at monetary-based growth, and clearly the yen should not be at 105, 106, should be more like you know, 118 to 120. It looks as if that could possibly happen. So that would be another offensive strategy, which is essentially you know, expect to see, the, uh, uh, to see the yen depreciate against the dollar. I think, again, I am painting in broad brushstrokes here, I think that's the picture over the next two to five years that we're going to see. So the offensive strategies really are those that are jumping from one orbit to the next, which are some key emerging market currencies. China, which is uncertain but could have major sort of consequences uh, to, uh, to, to global currencies, particularly to the euro-dollar rate. Uh, and then, of course, these emerging market currencies where perhaps we will see limited movement against the dollar. 
Now, how would the U.S. then correct its current account deficit? And, of course, you know, we've heard that there are various, various ways to look at it, and maybe it doesn't need to be corrected. Maybe it is sustainable. And, of course, there's been some academic work recently of uh, some of it uh, I personally feel is, is of dubious worth. Uh, there was a paper by, by, by two uh, uh, French economists, uh, Gurinchas and Hélène Ray, uh, who uh, indicated that you don't really even need to. You simply need to look at the net foreign asset position because U.S. claims on foreigners is, uh, is as great as foreigners' claims on U.S. assets, therefore a 10% depreciation of the U.S. dollar simply takes care of the current account deficit. And I didn't fully understand as to how a stock of assets can be compared to a flow variable like the current account or the trade deficit. But nevertheless, there, that's, there seems to be that kind of argument that, uh, that you know, it's, uh, it, it's for that reason sustainable current account deficits are pretty close to where they are right now. Uh, but it has to eventually correct. Uh, or correct to a point, I think it will happen within the dollar block itself. And it's happened once before in 1987-88, where these very economies of the world, uh, who had floating exchange rate, the Indonesian rupiah, Thai baht, uh, Malaysian ringgit, and so on, pegged their currencies to the U.S. dollar around that time, and essentially inflated their economies, in other words, pumped significant liquidity into their domestic monetary systems, so as to be able to keep their currencies more or less fixed or pegged against the U.S. dollar, that resulted in a significant credit boom in those economies that ran all the way from 1988 to 1996, 1995. It ended rather badly, of course, but that was for, for, for reasons where they allowed their reserves to run down. This time around, they will not do that. I think they will have a big credit boom, and they will run deficits against the U.S. dollar, uh, they will run uh, deficits against the U.S. economy. So in other words, they will switch from being current account surplus countries to current account deficit countries, help the U.S. to bring down its current account deficit, but at the same time, they will not suffer a currency crisis as they did in 1996 because they will have kept their level of reserves, which are very significantly large, so that if ever there is an outflow from their, their monetary system, they will have they have, that, they have that protection, they have uh, that ammunition to prevent uh, being sort of, you know, uh, uh, cast out of, uh, out, of, out of this kind of managed exchange rate system. So I think it is, I think the structure is, is feasible, I think it is credible, and I think that's the, the sort of world that we're moving into. The euro dollar rate is going to be, as I said, absolutely critical, and it's going to be very hard to forecast which way it's going to do in this scheme, in the schematic that I have, uh, 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 that I have presented to you, uh, I think there one would probably need to have a defensive strategy, uh, because one can consider many ways, and certainly, you know, I've tried to look at them, whether one should have strictly cyclical indicators, to so take a short-dated view, go along the euro at certain points, hedge your euro positions at certain other, at other times. Uh, it hasn't always worked. It's, 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 very complicated, and we use a multi-factor approach in, in my firm where we look at yield differentials, which generally go with growth, growth differentials. We look at proprietary flows, and we have access to a huge amount of proprietary flows for positioning uh, and, and sentiment and so on. But it's, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to, to have even a, uh, a successful kind of overlay strategy there. So, uh, so there I would say that uh, in this period, uh, I would say that uh, essentially a defensive strategy is, uh, is needed. But clearly offensive, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the currencies that are moving from one orbit to the next, and within each orbit, for example, the Canadian dollar, which I mentioned against the euro, seems to co-vary uh, in, in, in a certain way, but less so than, than say, the, uh, the Polish lottery. Uh, and so it's possible to, to view the, uh, uh, to take a view on, on, uh, on the Canadian dollar versus the Polish slotty within, and it's possible to have uh, a kind of offensive uh, strategy there. Arun, uh, I'd like to follow a comment that Professor Mundell made through to a comment that you made. Um, he mentioned that um, the depreciated dollar was in exacerbating um, inflationary pressures in the U.S. 
we have the rise in, in what some call a secular bull market in the commodity sector, um, amplified by depreciating currency. Now, with the Asian bloc currencies pegged to the dollar, we've got to be transmitting that inflation over to the Asian bloc. Um, you've indicated that um, the Asian bloc um, is not going to respond by adjusting their currencies, and particularly the emerging market Asia. And yet last year, and please correct me if my information is long, uh, is incorrect, we saw most of the Asian emerging market currencies, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, even China, indicate, well, first we saw them trade to the upper ranges of their currency bans against the U.S., and then we saw them all make comments to the fact that they were reconsidering what they would in future consider their currency pegs to be, whether they would consider their pegs to be a basket of commodities. Do you think that if commodity inflation um, and commodities are largely dollar priced were to continue to accelerate in the future, would they take steps to undo that with modest increases uh, in their currencies against the dollar? Perhaps modest, but um, again, I mean, uh, you're right about the uh, the the one, the uh, the Taiwan dollar and the Singapore dollar uh, starting to appreciate, and a lot of that, of course, has to do with this general sort of belief that they will move in line with the the Chinese one, and so it tends to wax and wane uh, to some extent with uh, with with those kinds of stories, uh, and I suppose when the Chinese one is actually depegged. Uh, unlikely to float, but I mean, when it is depegged, whenever that happens, I think you will see some pressure on all of these currencies, as well as others like the, the Thai baht and uh, uh, the, the Philippine peso and so on. But uh, eventually, I think they will, uh, uh, the intervention will continue from the Asian central banks, and they will manage those currencies. So I think a lot of this is, uh, I mean, the Korean won is a case in point. I mean, the South Korean economy is not doing well. In fact, it, it's, it's, it's probably, it's a laggard. It's, it's the, the sick man of, uh, of, of East Asia. Uh, and, uh, and yet, and, and they lowered rates at a time when I remember uh, the Thai central bank raised rates because Thailand was, like India, was getting a bit concerned about, uh, uh, about inflation and high commodity prices. But despite that, the one strengthened because around that time, uh, you know, uh, rumors have become very strong that a Chinese move was imminent. So I think you, you're, you're likely to continue to see this sort of occasional tilt towards strengthening with or without uh, inflation, with or without a uh, monetary policy response. But eventually, I think, regardless of what happens to China, I think the Asian currencies are likely to stay in a pretty tight band. Okay, thank you. Sandy, you are our practitioner on the panel, so what can you tell us about uh, ways in which we can play offense in this environment? Well, I guess I'd like to tell you about an academic approach to trying to make uh, money and currencies, being a, the practitioner. Um, I'd like to talk about capital markets rather than goods markets, not because goods markets are not important, but because I really think I understand capital markets better than, than good mar goods markets. I want to talk about how you think about a currency trade from an investment point of view, from a capital market point of view. So I just want to go over some very quick minor points here, like what is a currency trade from an investment point of view? Uh, well, suppose you sell euros three months forward for dollars. What is that? What, what, what does that swap trade mean? Well, you're borrowing euros, say, at 2% today. You're converting it to dollars today, and you're lending dollars at about 3% per annum. Uh, so what's the return on that trade? What's your return, say, after three months on that currency forward trade? Well, it's going to have two components. One is a yield component, which is you would pick up the yield differential at the rate of 1% per annum. And second, you'd pr pick up uh, a capital gain or loss component, because as you convert your dollars back to euros to cover that trade in three months, the exchange rate could be different than the exchange rate at which you did the original trade at. So what a currency swap trade is, is um, a borrowing-lending pair. You're borrowing in one country, you're lending in another country, 
you're picking up or giving up a yield differential and you're accepting an a currency risk, an exchange rate risk. Okay? So the first thing to realize about this is that this doesn't sound very different than any other capital market trade, right? Like suppose you buy, buy a stock, you get a yield and a capital gain. The fact that it's a high yield doesn't mean it's a great trade. It's a component of the trade. You would ask yourself, is the high yield justified? Is it sustainable? Is there something behind it? Or is it just a sign that things are going to go bankrupt? You know, as you, okay? So, so it, you can already see when you think about a currency trade, it has all of the, the, the components of any other trade once you think of it as a forward trade rather than something you're entering into the commodity market to do to buy commodities in one currency and sell in another currency in the spot market. The, the other point that's very important about a, a currency trade is it's always a pair. You don't just sell dollars. Like you don't go, go to your window and start throwing dollar bills out. You know? You're always buying something. You're selling something and you're buying something. But that's not even correct for a forward trade. For a forward trade, what you're doing is you're transporting capital from one place to another place and subjecting it to the risk, the relative risk of the two places. You're borrowing in one place, lending in another place. So from my, my point of view in, in, in trading and in modeling and everything we do is, is based upon a particular model that I'm going to set out here for you. Uh, we're going to ask ourselves, what's the return from borrowing in one country, lending in another country? When should you move capital from one country to another? When are there opportunities to move capital from one country to another? That's what a currency trade is. Um, Systematically, the most important source of opportunities are the non-synchronicity of business cycles. Sometimes capital is simply more productive in one country than another country. Um, now, the kind of productivity of capital that we're interested in is the kind of productivity of capital that appears at the short end of the yield curve. Because remember, we're doing a, tr a fixed income trade. We're borrowing in one country, lending in another country at the three-month end of the yield curve the very short end of the yield curve. Um, what kinds of projects are getting financed at the very short end of the yield curve? Well, it's primarily the building of inventories or the building down of inventories on the reverse side. When business cycle expands, companies want to build inventories. Well, except in the internet bubble, you don't issue equities to build inventories for three months, right? Um, that didn't work. Uh, you don't actually issue, it's not really a great idea to issue long-term debt to build up your inventories. Well, how do you build up your inventories? You, you go to the money markets, either uh, your banks, commercial paper, etc. So the most responsive area to business cycle fluctuations and in investment demand is the short end of the yield curve. Uh, obviously, there are other situations when the demand for capital gets expressed in the fixed income market, such as in German unification back in the early 90s, uh, when that project was financed essentially in the fixed income market. Germany didn't equitize, try to equitize East Germany and sell it off in the stock market. It basically tried to finance the reconstruction of, of Germany by issuing debt. That debt has to be held globally. See, some people think of currencies as a zero-sum game or something of this sort. It has nothing to do with that. Currencies are fixed income, and it's, it's investing capital in one country rather than another. Currency risk is no different than equity risk. It's simply country equity risk. Um, what basically the reason you can ma you can make money systematically over the long run in this kind of trading in the currency markets is institutional investors do not hold foreign denominated short term fixed income. You just don't find it. OK, so people are going to hold their own country's money markets. No one holds any other country's money markets because that just gives you, in their view, currency risk. But actually what it's doing is allocating capital at the short end of the yield curve. Um, what we do is, is we, we look at three criteria, just like a global bank would. We, we want to lend to countries, that is, belong in countries where economic growth prospects are relatively good, short-term interest rates are relatively high, and monetary policy is or will be tight. And these are the same kinds of things you would do in building an equity model of a company. Economic growth prospects are going to be generating the real income stream to pay back, the real, to pay back in real terms the loans. Uh, higher short-term interest rate, everything else constant is higher yield. Everything else held constant, you'd rather have higher yield than lower yield. 
You want to have a tight monetary policy, just as you don't want dilution in, in, if you're an equity holder. You print more money, it's going to depreciate. You print more stock, you issue more stocks, it's going to lower the value of your existing shares. So you can value a country's currency in this, from an investment point of view in the same way you might think of valuing an equity. So we'd like to lend in countries where all these, we like to lend in these sort of strong countries, and you'd like to borrow in the relatively weaker countries where economic growth prospects are poor, short term interest rates are relatively low, monetary policy is or will be loose. So this is a model. You can quantify all of these things. You can build a risk structure and risk models and actually apply modern portfolio theory the same way you would to equities, but apply it to these fixed income trades at the short, very short end of the yield curve. We've been doing this for 13 years, and the, the, the gross returns, that is, we, we talked a, a little bit of uh, our net returns were mentioned. That, now our net returns tell you something about our fees and our gross returns. The gross returns tell you about how well the model works. And we've been, we've been doing this for over 13 years and grossing over 20% a year. So I think there's a lot of empirical evidence for this. That's empirical evidence for this capital market approach to uh, uh, currencies. This is a little abstract. So I, I remember I, can't, I was invited to the meeting before this where I heard Carl Icahn talk about his great trades. So I thought it might entertain you or interest you to go from an abstraction to some what do you, you know, what's some, what's some good trades you can do what, what, that we've done? What have we done? Okay. Uh, what, are the, what are the ups and downs? And how does that relate to the current situation that you see? Well, let me talk about Canada. Okay. In 1996, uh, there was an Asian boom in 19, if you remember the first Asian boom in 1995, 1996, 1997, um, Canada participated in that. Have people thinking of it as a commodity currency. There are there's an appreciation of the currency for that reason. There's a lot of enthusiasm for Canada there. Um, it's got its fiscal deficit under control in 1996. Uh, unemployment fell from about 12% in 1993 to 10% in 1996 to 9.5% in early 97. All the smart money was moving into Canada uh, because of all these good things happening in Canada. Um, GDP growth was at 2.7%, which was really good for Canada. The um, uh, Canadian Quebec separatism problems had ended uh, in the 1994 referendum. Kind of Quebec separation failed, and um, people weren't talking about Quebec separation anymore. Martin was the uh, uh, finance minister, and he's, he's, he's really a bring the fiscal deficit under control, and he was. I mean, the capital markets loved him, correctly so. Yet everybody talking about Canada. It's a great trade. Now, what, what I thought was absolutely amazing about this is they were, they were talking about buying Canada for U.S. dollars. So to me, that's a relative value trade, and you can't analyze that by just saying how great Canada is. Let's talk about what was happening in the U.S. at the time. Um, well, Canadian interest rates had come down to about 3% from 7.5%. Meanwhile, U.S. interest rates were about 5.25%, while Canadian unemployment rate came down from 12 to 9.5%. U.S. Un US unemployment rate um, was, came down to like 5.25%. Um, Canadian interest rates, which were normally like 200 basis points above U.S. interest rates, were now 200, 225 basis points below U.S. interest rates. U.S. GDP growth was 4.5%. Canada was 2.7, which was great for Canada. So the point is, Canada was doing well. There was not, this was a great country. And it was doing really well relative to itself. So if you could trade Canada in 1997 against Canada in 1992, that would have been a great trade. But that's not what everyone was doing. Everyone was saying, Canada is great. Let's buy Canadian dollars. And of course, they would buy it against U.S. dollars, because that's what you do. You have to buy it with something, right? Um, well, uh, the, end the end result was that the Canadian, the, the Canadian dollar probably fell, you know, about 8% that year. You pick up about two and a quarter percent of carry. Uh, we probably made about 18% um, on that trade in 1997 and then another 21% in 1998. Exactly for the model reasons that we had that it's a relative value trade. Every currency trade is a relative value trade. You can't just talk about um, 
one country at a time. If, if, you, if you want to do this relative value trade, you want to compare the U.S. Uh, to Canada. Another trade, uh, Australia. Um, uh, Australia kind of, Australian dollar kind of peaked around 80 cents to the U.S. dollar at the height of the Asian boom, the first Asian boom, somewhere in, in, in 1997. By September 11, 2001, it was down to 48 cents. Okay? Everyone was saying, well, this is a commodity currency. Um, you know, we're going to have a global recession, and in global recessions, commodity currencies fall. Okay? Now, again, so it was all these bad things that are going to happen to Australia. Um, but it turns out, when I've, just, I've been telling you about the, the Australian dollar relative to the U.S. dollar. Now, remember, the World Trade Center is located in New York City. It's not located in Melbourne okay, or Sydney. The, this shock to the system was occurring in the U.S. We were the hardest hit. We were relatively hard hit by this relative to Australia. Our rates between September 2001 and, and um, 2003 came down from 3% to 1%. Australian rates stayed at 5.25% the whole time. Australian GDP growth was about twice U.S. GDP growth in the same period. Um, their monetary policy, however you're going to measure it, was tighter. Um, uh, so this was another situation where if, you, if we analyze this as an investment trade as a relative value trade, the same way you might do in you know, selling one automobile company and buying another automobile company on a relative value trade, uh, you get a completely different conclusion than you get by just reading the newspaper about um, this single country at a time and selling it. Uh, we ended up making about 50% on this trade. Um, so, uh, I guess my feeling, just to, to summarize, it, it, whenever you read in the newspaper something about what's bad about the U.S. and people are selling dollars, say buying euros, you should always ask yourself, well, m maybe there is a problem in country one, but is country two relatively better? Okay, what's the relative value trade here? Every currency trade is a relative value trade by definition. Okay, so if, if um, uh, we're running this, this um, uh, if there are capital flows out of the U.S. into China, it doesn't follow that the dollars, from a capital market point of view, not from a goods market point of view, but from a capital market point of view, it doesn't follow that the dollar needs to depreciate relative to the euro because of the capital flows out of the U.S. Uh, into China. Um, so, again, I would I just kind of, in, in any analysis of currency trades, I think you should always listen to all these statements about current accounts and goods flows, but it's been our experience systematically that capital flows end up being a better driver of, the rel of currency returns than goods flows. Sandy, thank you. Quickly, um, would you mind explaining for us what the forward rate bias is and what percentage of your trading exploits, exploits the forward rate, tries, uh, forward rate bias in currency trade? There's something called the efficient market hypothesis, which all of you have heard. Um, and one of, the con one of the ideas of the efficient market hypothesis is that the expected, the expected risk-adjusted returns on everything should be equalized. That's sort of a tautology. And this is applied to currencies. They drop the word risk-adjusted, and it should be that the expected return from, a, from a, a forward trade should be zero because there's no capital. Okay? It's a zero investment. It's used up zero capital. And it's a, you know, currencies are a zero-sum game to people. So the expected return from a forward trade should be zero. Now, I already told you the expected return from a forward trade is, is equal to the currency appreciation, expected currency appreciation, plus the interest rate differential. Okay? So, in other words, the expected currency return should equal the interest rate differential, meaning that if, current, if, if, the, um, if Australia has a um, um, three and 375 basis points per annum interest rate advantage over the euro, which it does now, then it should appreciate 
it should depreciate at the rate of 375 basis points. So the rate of depreciation should equal the rate of interest rate differential, so your expected return should be zero. So the foreign currency forward bias that, that um, I was just mentioning is that econometrically, that turns out to be a lie. Okay, it's just false. It's, it's numerous papers. It's, it's simply the case that on average, the expected uh, currency depreciation is not equal to the interest rate differential. Um, and what percentage of your trading actually captures the forward rate bias? I'm going to give you a rough answer to that. Mm -hmm. Roughly, in our view, sometimes this forward rate bias is justified and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. So that, to give you a crazy example, in 1992, Sweden tried to defend its currency by raising interest rates to 75 basis points mm -hmm. per night. Right. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Now, that's not sustainable. They could never pay it back. I mean, I could borrow, try to borrow a zillion dollars from all of you promising you 3,000% interest. You're never going to lend it to me, okay? Because you know I'm never going to really pay it back to you in real terms. So what's important to us is the sustainability. So when you, it's these other factors of the tightness of monetary policy, economic growth, that plays an important component. So, and I think that the, the forward bias probably, if you took that, if you, in and of itself, um, I don't know, 20%, 25% of total return? Okay, thank you. You know, as a rough... Given the time, envelope. let's get some questions in. Folks, um, do you... Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, let, let's, let's do one so we get, uh, okay. get uh, give other people a chance. Well, let, me, uh, let me give them one to uh, Aaron. Uh, your focus is on your dollar trade. Uh, given the uh, impact of differential growth rates, US 3 and 4 versus Euro 1 2, uh, short term rates, US 3 versus Euro, uh, ECB 2, and lack of intervention on the Treasury and ECB part, what do you think happening in the short term? Is what part is differential growth rates, short term interest rates, and also what is the impact of the French Dutch election on the Constitution? <laughs> In 25 words <laughs> I suppose one should be looking at uh, real interest rate differential, so adjusted for inflation, and I would suggest that, uh, that they haven't really changed. And so for that reason, while the nominal short end in the U.S. is moving up, and it's not moving up in the U.S., uh, it's not moving up in the Eurozone, uh, inflation is also stickier in the Eurozone and it's rising here. So we're still essentially where we were when the Fed began to raise rates. Uh, and that includes right down the yield curve. In fact, I would say at the 10-year, there's in fact been a deterioration where our real 10-year rate is lower than when it, what it was uh, 12 months ago and 24 months ago. So um, I think that clearly, I think, where in, I think interest rate differentials are, are critical and I think the... Uh, uh, and, I, and I agree that, you know, I mean, the forward rate bias doesn't work, but certainly has not worked consistently, uh, uh, or not even consistently. I mean, it's just worked very poorly uh, in with, with the dollar-euro. So the carry trade helps up to a point, which is essentially the carry trade being where the uh, covered interest parity doesn't uh, hold. Uh, but in this case, I think we should be looking at real rates. We always should be looking at real rates, and in this case, it's only a mirage that, uh, that the interest rate differential is widening. If uh, tomorrow the Chinese currency were to be floated, what would the implications of the dollar and other currencies? I don't know who to ask that. Okay. So, Bob, you have thoughts? Well, <coughs> first, there's no chance it's going to happen. Yeah, there's a, uh, the Chinese think that floating the exchange rate would do all kinds of damaging things to their management of their economies, and uh, uh, so I just don't think it's uh, likely. But I think the first thing that you would have, if in fact that did occur, uh, would be uh, it would be then start to fluctuate. And it, if, if there's no intervention in it, there'd be uh, a lot of fluctuations. Uh, first, uh, because at the present time, the Chinese are buying up dollars, and then they, they don't intervene anymore. They float, and the first impact of this is for the uh, RMB to appreciate. So the dollar would go down. Uh, 
Um, I don't know how much. It might go down to, um, to uh, seven. It might go down to six, something like this. It might even go down more than this because there'd be a lot of overshooting in it and people would speculate it's going to go way down. And then, of course, the, at this point, the Chinese would panic and uh, start to go back to fixing it again. But they'd have lost the, um, the uh, great advantage they have at the present of not changing their policy uh, since uh, 1994. And therefore, uh, they have the extra cachet of being able to say they haven't been manipulating the exchange rate. <clears throat> A quick follow on when um, the Asian bloc intervenes in their currencies, they take the dollars they buy and then buy our treasury securities, which uh, keeps our interest rate low. What do you think the knock-on effect to our interest rates, particularly on the long end, would be? Uh, uh, I w wouldn't be able to put a number on it, but I would not think it would be all that great. <laughs> okay. Questions? Mm -hmm. back. Um, Professor, a uh, question for Professor Mandel in terms of the foreign exchange, um, if I'm not mistaken, what we call the impossible trinity, which is um, having a stable exchange rate, having control of your monetary policy, and having control of your inflation price structure. In your global currency, um, that means we're giving up essentially, um, or in order to get Which of those two um, you consider more important in, in your scheme is going to be given up? Uh, well, I think think if, if you had a uh, let's say a, a, the euro area and the dollar area to make the simplest thing had had uh, decided to lock exchange rates and then um, have a joint monetary policy, uh, you'd have uh, more or less the same inflation rate in both areas, and uh, you'd, the, that inflation rate would be determined by, of course, the joint monetary policy. Uh, but I don't think that there'd be much of a, a, ga a loss here. To, I think that on balance, that that combined area would still be subject to uh, uh, to um, the business cycle. It would be a different kind of business cycle, at least, because it would be it would be a, a business cycle that would be shared with the because of monetary integration. But uh, I think that um, the problems of management of the two economies would uh, uh, they'd probably complement each other and been, been been a good thing. Now, uh, there's not much. Uh, obviously, under fixed exchange rates, the country in the long run has to give up, it do, cannot have an independent monetary policy. You can either fix the exchange rate and have a, a, a passive monetary policy. You have to use, let the balance of payments determine long run monetary policy. Uh, or you can have monetary independence and uh, then uh, do some kind of inflation targeting. So now, the, the, what would be important would be that the United, if you take this joint area, uh, of uh, the U.S. $12 trillion of GDP in the euro area, $9 trillion. You'd have a $21 trillion area, um, and you'd have uh, price stability over that area. So you would not give up month. You wouldn't have the U.S. price level going up and the uh, European price level going down. It all, whenever we have a fixed exchange rate area, uh, both price levels go up and down together. They have... There's a whole business cycle that's all the same. You have the same more or less inflation rate. You have the same inflation rate in California as you have in New York. And you would have then the same, you have the same inflation rate in Ireland plus or minus some little uh, productivity differential as you do in Spain or in uh, Germany or in uh, Luxembourg. And you'd have the same thing in different parts of uh, the, this joint monetary union. I think there was a second part to your question which I didn't answer about the French referendum on May 29th. And for that I would say that I simply looked to the Irish rejection of the Nice Treaty which had no real impact on the euro dollar rate. And so even if we get a no, uh, and it looks as if we are going to get a no because the momentum is building against it, I think the, uh, the, um, uh, the effects are going to be quite temporary. Okay, one more. Douglas? Sandy, I've noticed over the years that your model creates uh, sometimes much higher profits than other vehicles. Why is it that, that uh, what is it about conditions that allows the model to make more money in some cases than those sideways others? 
in, um, in physics, there's some, something called the double slit experiment done with either photons or electrons. It turns out physicists um, can't explain, and they accept in quantum, in quantum mechanics, you, you accept the idea that you can't always tell whether the electron is going to go through the left slit or the right slit. Okay? Now, there's an extent to which when you ask uh, anybody about their their strategy, they can come up with an answer. I can explain to you why I lost money last year, say, and why I made money in some sense in uh, 2003. Um, but I'm kind of um, curfitting. You know, I'm, I'm given I didn't do anything different. I don't do anything different the years I make money or the years I lose money. Um, you know, just like you're shooting out the photon and it goes through the left and the right. You know, I'm, I'm not sure there's an honest, answer, true answer to your question, either for me or for many other managers where we're constantly, you know, you're always asking this, you know, why did you have to have a bad year last year? Yeah. <laughs> it's been like the previous year. And indeed, if you could figure that out, then you could just change what you're doing or do minus. If you could just do minus the positions last year and double up the positions the previous year, think of how much more money you'd make. And that's true. But if I could do that, I would. I mean, I don't like to lose money. I mean, it's, it's definitely more fun to make money. Um, but I'm not, I, I think you... As investors, you have to come to terms with, with, with quantum mechanics, to be honest with you, okay? That not all these things are going to be deterministic or determinable or uh, 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 improvable. Well, I think that's the first time we've ever concluded a session on the wave-particle duality. <laughs> and my understanding is, uh, of physics is that actually the particle goes through both slits. So... Perhaps next year you will both make and lose money, and your investors can choose which. Um, so, on that note, I'm going to turn the panel back over to Steve. Thank you. That was good. Um, I, I do want to um, uh, recognize Putnam Lavelle for underwriting today's session. They are not here today, uh, obviously, or probably working on some money management deal that we'll read about in tomorrow's paper. So let's let's recognize them and, and thank them when you can. Um, you know, this is a great panel, and we always, people come up to me and say, Steve, how do you do it? And I, I'll say to you again, it's not me. It's the power of our Rolodex. Um, and with that, uh, last night at dinner we were talking about how the uh, Japanese have never really appropriately uh, apologized to the Chinese uh, and, and on that note, or in that spirit, let me first apologize to Professor Mundell for stalking you for over four years now, <laughs> unrelenting, till he finally said yes and he's come. So thank you. Um, also, uh, I want to thank uh, Ken and Mark uh, of Kenmar for introducing us uh, to Sandy Grossman. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, our friends at Citigroup have such a deep bench, my gosh. Uh, Beverly Buker and David Cottrell, thank you for introducing us uh, to Arun Motiani. Very, we're very, very appreciative, and, and what a crystal clear explanation. Um, and Hunt, this was Hunt's idea for today's panel. So, um, again, it's not me at all. It's, it's the power of us. So I want to thank you. Uh, May 19th is our next session on the, um, on the Latin American um, uh, outlook and the risks and opportunities there. That's Ryan Dartnell's series on the emerging markets. And um, Susan, are you here, Susan Benjamin? Raise your hand. Susan, Susan is a gift uh, to us. She comes to us from Schulte Roth. She's now uh, the program director of the Greenwich Roundtable. And uh, using all her background and her years at Schulte, she's bringing a wealth of information and knowledge to us. So please welcome Susan and say hello to her when you can. Um, and, and that's about it. We'll see you on May 19th. And Bob, Arun, Sandy, good job. Thank you. Thank you.